Well, welcome to Holy Trinity and St Saviour's Sermons. Here we seek to live life to the full and I hope this sermon inspires you to do exactly that. This morning I'm reading Romans 6 verses 15 to 23 and if you've got a Bible anywhere near you in the rows it's on page 1133. What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's play around. There we are. On there. Thank you. I was given a very serious warning at the beginning of the service today that I'm not allowed to do the two hour version. (laughs) I would however point out that we're five minutes ahead of schedule according to what Neil said. (laughs) So I'm going to claim them. (laughs) They're mine. It's possible, it's possible that everything you thought you knew about Christianity is wrong. It's possible. Now the way to gauge this is to consider what your reaction was to that last verse that we just read. Let's read it again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now it's possible to understand that verse like this. If you do wrong stuff, you'll die and go to hell. But if you submit to God, you'll go to heaven. Yes? No. That's exactly not what it says. But unfortunately, that's an understanding that so many people have of what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about. How anyone can describe uh, going round to people and pointing at them and saying, if you don't do what we say, you'll go to hell as good news, I'm not sure. But that's the way some people see it. Now, probably that view of Christianity comes from about 1500 years or so ago when it was a great tool for keeping the peasants under control. Because, let's face it, if you're a peasant, your life is not great, is it? And if you've got this massive church just down the road, which you've had to give loads of money to, whatever, and if the church down the road says to you, don't worry, keep looking after Mother Church, and guess what? After you die, everything's going to be fine for you. Then, of course, you're going to carry on being a peasant, aren't you? And being okay about the whole deal. Nowadays, we're not peasants and we're not okay about that deal because it sounds all wrong. Because it is wrong. The Bible doesn't say here, you know, if you do what we say, you're going to be okay after you die. When we read that verse there, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ, there are three very important words there 
that we mostly misunderstand because of that false view of the good news of Jesus that has come down to us down the ages. Let me just deal very rapidly with those three words. So the first word is sin. Now, we misunderstand that word, and if you read the whole New Testament, you'll see that it doesn't mean what you think it means. You think sin, some of you, means me doing something bad. You know, the time I swore when I dropped something on my toe, or when I was angry when I got home and I said something I shouldn't have done, or when I stole something, or we see sin as being those wrong actions. And I ex talked about this a lot more in the one I did two weeks ago, so go and have a look at the recording of that. But we need to understand that Paul is not talking about individual wrong actions. To Paul, sin is a weight, a drag on our lives. A gravity that pulls us down. Have you ever noticed that it's much easier to do the wrong thing than it is to do the right thing? Have you ever noticed that when you're tired, words of kindness don't slip out by accident? They don't, do they? When you're tired and emotional, you tend to say the wrong thing. Have you ever noticed that you don't accidentally keep everything tidy? No, we accidentally mess up, don't we? We pu are pulled down by a gravity that seems to be difficult to get rid of. That's what Paul means by sin. He means a gravity, a moral gravity that we find it hard to get away from. And then he talks about death. He says here, for the wages of sin is death. So we've established that sin means the gravity that pulls us down. And then he says it leads to death. Now, I want you to understand that when Paul talks here about death, he isn't talking about the end of bodily function. He's not talking about the time you stop breathing. Paul is talking here about a separation from all that you should be. Now, let's go right back to the beginning of the Bible, very rapidly. I've written down in my notes here, brief reference. And when we look back at the very beginning, and you know the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 to 3, and you read that story, and I'm not going to go into whether it's a real story or a myth or whatever, we can talk about that at any length later, but suffice it to say that the story says this, that Adam and Eve are told, do this thing, if you disobey and do this thing, you will die. And they do this thing, and guess what? They're still walking around, and they're still breathing, and everything. But, and this is the critical thing, but... Their relationship to the God who made them has been destroyed. When God said to them, if you do this wrong thing, you will die. He didn't mean you will fall over. He said, what he meant was the relationship between you and the God who made you, the relationship between you and the life you should have, the life you could have, the life you were made to be, would be ruptured. Doing away with that whole idea, you know, that uh, if I th throw my fist in the face of God, he he's going to destroy me, a lightning bolt's going to strike me down. It doesn't say that. It's never said that. And I've put in here, don't tell the, go the golfer and vicar joke, but you can ask me what it is afterwards, because it's brilliant. <laughs> Sin, the drag downwards. Death, the gap that ensues between us and God, us and all that should be. Paul is saying here that that drag brings death, it brings gap, it brings separation. And then he goes on to say eternal life. But the gift of God is eternal life. And again, we must understand what this means. 
When the Bible talks about eternal life, it doesn't mean sitting on a cloud with a harp forever and ever. Somebody once described heaven as being like being in an eternal church service. And I think, no thank you very much. (laughs) Eternal life, when the Bible talks about eternal life, in some ways it might be better to translate it as this. The life of the age to come. The life of the age to come. I can tell you the Greek, but you'll be bored, so I won't do that now. The life of the age to come. It's very important to understand that in the day that Paul is writing here, the Jews of this day were looking forward to the arrival of a Messiah. What in Greek is called a Christ, a Messiah, the promised one of God. And when that Messiah arrived, that would be the start of the age to come. People were looking forward to an age when God would show his power and kingdom and things would change. And Paul says that has happened in Jesus. In Jesus that has happened, the age to come is upon us and you can be part of it. You can be in. You can be part of that age to come. You can enjoy all that God wants for you as a gift. Paul is not telling you here to choose between two destinations. Paul is saying to you there are two ways of life. There is the gravity that pulls you down into that separation from all that you should be in God. And there is that life of the age to come which unites you with the God of the universe. Now to do this he uses a picture. He uses a picture of slavery. Did you notice the number of times it talks in the bit before about being a slave? Now, of course, slavery was much more common in those days. Or actually, to be honest, there are probably more slaves today than there were in that day. But thankfully, we don't see it as being a normal part of life in our day. Slavery was common in those days. It was a picture that he could pick out and he could say, you've seen a slave. You know what a slave does. Paul is saying here, effectively, that you are a slave to one of those directions. Now, it's quite a shock in our freedom-loving, individual rights-based life in the West to hear ourselves described as being slaves. But Paul says, it's not a question of whether you want to be a slave or you want to be free, Paul is saying that you are a slave of one or other of those approaches. And of course, you say, I'm not anyone's slave. I'm not anyone's slave. Well, let's just park the word slave for a minute. Let's just park that word there because we don't like that word. So if it worries you that the word slave sort of keeps coming up, try and replace it maybe with follower or dependent, or disciple, or fanboy, or whatever. But basically, what Paul is saying, that all of us, in some way or another, depend or live for something else that is out of our control. Either that sin, the gravity that draws us down and separates us, or the life that God wants to give us. And you still say, I'm not that. I'm a free person. I'm free. Well, let's try a little thought experiment, okay? Let's try a little thought experiment here. Let's have a look at some important things in your life. Let's look at some important stuff that you have in your life. And Let me ask you some questions. Obviously, these are rhetorical questions. Uh, Feel free to answer them loudly if you want to, but it's probably best you don't because I've got the answers written down. I might ask you, why do you have those friends? 
And you might say, well, they make me feel welcome. They make me feel cared for. And I might ask you, why are you spending all that time at the office? Or why are you spending so much time at home working on all those extra qualifications? And you might say to me, well, it makes me more employable. This makes me more likely to get that promotion. And I might say to you, why do you go to that church? And you might say to me, it makes me feel more peaceful. It makes me more aware of God. And I might say to you, well, why do you uh, have a few drinks when you go out? And you might say to me, well, it makes me feel more relaxed, more friendly. And I might say to you, why do you have that partner? And you might say to me, well, he or she makes me feel special. He or she makes me laugh. Now, I've deliberately engineered that a bit to make the point. But I think that's about right, isn't it? The way we would be thinking about that. Did you notice the phrase that kept coming up? Makes me, makes me, makes me. It makes me feel special. They make me more employable. They make me feel more peaceful. It makes me more relaxed. Now, I'm not saying that's bad or good. I'm not putting a moral value on that, but I'm just saying to you, it's simply a fact that our lives are full of places where we are led by others, where we are guided by circumstance, where we are constrained by everything about us. We live under the dominance and control of others. We do. All of us do. In one sense, we are enslaved because we have to live within the orbit of other people. And all of us make decisions not based on pure freedom, but based on what makes me. Any neuroscientist or psychologist will tell you that this is so. And I can list you some experiments later if you want me to go over the literature. But all of us live in an orbit where we are controlled in one way, shape or form. And Paul says you must recognise this fact and must make a stark choice. Will you be enslaved by the drag, the sin, the moral gravity that pulls us down and separates us from the God who wants you to have life? Will you just meander through life out of touch with the God who made you? Or will you embrace the gift of life which comes in Jesus? Now you say, I'm not religious. And if you're saying today, I'm not a religious person, then could you come and see me afterwards? And I think in two minutes I can prove you are. Every single person in this room is religious. You might not be the same as us, but you are a religious person. Everyone is. I guarantee you that every so often you take part in a religious ceremony. Guarantee it. Come and see me afterwards and I'll prove it to you. But anyway, I'm not religious either. Don't like religion. Never did. Wasn't brought up in a religious house. Wasn't brought up in a Christian house. Like the fact that it's true. That was me. I like that. Don't care about religion. Like the truth. And you say, I don't believe all that Jesus stuff. Don't believe all that Jesus stuff, you know. It's all a bit sort of wacky. And I say, why not? Have you ever actually looked at the facts about Jesus? Have you ever actually looked at the facts about what happens in this here book here and considered how accurate or otherwise they are? Have you ever actually asked the question, could this be true? 
G.K. Chesterton, the chap who wrote all the Father Brown books, was a, a Christian man in, living at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, and he once said this, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting, has not been tried and found wanting, it has been found difficult and left untried. It's not that people look at it and go, you know what, I've examined that and I think it's untrue. Or, I, I, you know, I can see all the flaws. They just said, you know what, I can't be bothered. And I think, when it comes to a question like this, am I going to live for downward gravity and, you know, basically 70 years and then who knows what? Or am I going to live for life in all its fullness under the God who made me, I think that's worth looking into, don't you? Um, people who do the surveys that go into this sort of thing, they've come up with a term for this. It's called apatheism. So it basically is a combination of the words apathy and atheism. Now, any, if you, every now and then the popular press will come out and say that, you know, Something like over half the population now call themselves atheists. And fine, if people will tick that box, that's fine. But what they tend to find when you dig deeper into it is when they're asked, why are you an atheist? People generally go, I don't know. Can't be bothered. They're an apatheist. And I say to you then, are you going to be a person who goes... Uh, happily down into all this gravity and lets it go because you can't be bothered. And I say, why not have a look and have a think? As you found out, we're uh, not having any alpha courses for a while, but don't worry, someone else is. Or there are a number of people here who would love to tell you why they think the stuff about Jesus is true. Uh, and if I get you in a corner, I'd love to, but um, maybe you want to talk to someone a bit more sociable. Uh, but I would love to say to you why I think this is true. I would love to give you this. Now, I shouldn't give it to you because my brother's and he lent it to me, but I'll get him another one. It's, um, it's called Simply Christian, and it's a brilliant book by a chap who is actually still alive. And it says, it's basically a description of the Christian faith and why it's relevant and true. And if you want, I'll give that to you quite happily. Take it away. I'll get my brother another one. That's fine. Don't worry. You're very welcome to have it. You can tell me you're borrowing it, and I know what that means when it comes to books, but that's fine. And you can give it back to me if you want, but it's yours if you want it. Please don't walk out of this building and say, you know what, I'd like to look into it, but I don't. Well, you can, because I'll give you that, okay? That is yours if you want to. So don't just say, I don't believe in all that Jesus stuff just because you can't be bothered because there is so much about it that is true and real. And last of all, you say to me, you say, okay, okay, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. I believe that stuff. But I'm not going to go nuts about it. Not like you standing up there and ranting. I'm not going to go nuts about this Jesus stuff and I want you to picture my wife in a month's time now we're uh, my daughter's getting married our daughter in fact is getting married in a month's time and my daughter is a rampant feminist so Julie's doing the speech <laughs> under my careful dark no um, but uh, now Julie's doing the speech and I want you to imagine my my wife standing up at this speech and starting out and she says, uh, well, it's great that you're all here and it's marvellous that Naomi's getting married today, but she's not going to go mad about it. She's not going to take it too seriously. I mean, marriage is one thing, but you don't want to go mad, do you? I mean, I think she'd be forced to sit down fairly rapidly. And can you imagine talking to your friends and you say, do you know what? We've got these little people who live in our house. <laughs> but you know what? We're not going to take them too seriously. We don't want anyone to think we're those kind of mad parents. 
We're just going to let them get on with it. And every now and then, I believe in them. Yep, but we're not going to get too serious about them. How would you feel about taking that attitude to life? Okay, I believe in, there's, in a God, but I'm not going to go nuts about it. If there's a real God, and he really loves me, and he really wants me to have all that there is in life, do you know what? I want to go nuts. I want to go serious. I want to take that on board. It doesn't mean I become a raving lunatic. It just means that I actually enjoy all that God wants for me. C.S. Lewis, the bloke who wrote all the Narnia books, he said this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. So go nuts. Enjoy it all, because it's all for you. And at the end you say, what do I do about all this then? I do want to look into this Jesus stuff. I do want to understand whether it's true. I do want to find out what it means to accept that gift of God. It says gift. It's a present. You don't have to do anything. It's a present. You can have it now. I don't want to be constantly dragged down by life. I don't want to live in that life of moral gravity which just leads me to be separate from all that God wants me to be. I want to enjoy that eternal life, life of the ages, the life where God is real. And I'm not going to tell you now because I haven't got time. But I will say this, and what's more is that if you're not interested, there's not much point in me going on about it. But if you do want to know what that means, then he's paid to tell you. <laughs> so you can ask him. Or you can ask me. Or you can ask any one of about 50 people sat here who have accepted that gift and can tell you what it's worth. Or just come and talk to some of these people over here. We'll be praying, happy to pray with you and ask God to open it up to you. But if you really want to know what is it that gives you this gift of life in all its fullness, the life of the ages, then don't just leave it. Paul presents us all every day, all of us, not just saying whether you're a person who's religious or not, presents all of us every day with a choice. Choose the downward drag of nature or choose all that God wants you to be. Choose wisely.